Welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here with us today on this chilly Halifax afternoon. I'm not sure who's joining us from Halifax or not, but um, it's been a very, very cold last few days here. So if you're here, you'll know what I'm talking about. But um, I just wanted to welcome you all to, um, to our Q&A session today with Dr. Stephen Glazier. Um, this is part of a series of initiatives, um, events, workshops, things like that, that we have launched over the winter term here in the Faculty of Science. So we've been calling this Pathway Exploration Weeks, um, with every week focusing on a different career pathway um, possible with a with a science degree um, and each week we'll be highlighting different learning and skill building oppor opportunities and connecting our student community with um, our fantastic alumni with advisors with um, grad students with a number of uh, industry experts uh, to answer your questions about you know what what's life like um, in, in these different career paths um, a little bit about you know our fantastic alums uh, journey into their current career paths. And uh, yeah, we're, we're so excited to be launching this. We started this on January 25th with a week focused on um, uh, science and society. So talking to people who had careers in uh, policy and law and healthcare and sustainability and all that kind of fun stuff. This week is focused on research and discovery. Um, and, and this event, I think, is the third event we've had this week, and we're doing a final event tomorrow all on Honours 101. So if you're a student here thinking about honours uh, in the next couple of years, then um, please uh, please join us tomorrow morning with Dr. Leslie Fillmore. So just one more thing before we, we jump into our Q&A today. I did want to also mention that attending these workshops as a student, um, you can get uh, recognition on the co-curricular record, which if you don't know what that is, um, is kind of a parallel transcript to your academic transcript that um, captures all of the stuff that you did outside of the classroom. So um, if you are a student um, and, and have your co-curricular record set up, then uh, please search out these workshops on the CCR and add them and we'll make sure to get you all validated. So um, yeah, so today we have Dr. Stephen Glazier uh, joining us today for a little Q&A. Um, Stephen is a graduate of the PhD program in the Department of Physics here at Dalhousie um, and is currently a senior research scientist with Navonics, which you're based in Dartmouth, correct? Uh, Bedford, actually. Bedford, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, so Stephen's work is really integral to bringing the state-of-the-art battery testing solutions from lab to market, which um, the Department of Physics at Dal and, and Dalhousie in general um, is quite quite famous for and, and well known for. So um, for those who don't know who are with us today, um, Novonics emerged out of uh, Dr. Jeff Don's lab here at Dow. Um, and yeah, they've been doing incredible work here um, since their founding in 2013. So yes, we've we've invited Stephen in today to chat with us about your experience as as a student, you know, from your undergrad days to your your PhD days um, and how some of those experiences along the way um, yeah, shaped you into your, your path and your, your sort of end point as being a senior research scientist today. So i um, glad to see we have, we have a, a bunch of students here today to join us. And Stephen, I guess I'll turn it over to you for, for a minute here to just say hi and welcome yourself and, uh, and see if uh, then we'll turn to the, the group here and see if anyone has questions. But we've got some questions as well. So yeah, take it away. All right, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. I see some familiar names here. Uh, Lauren's there. Mark, who's down the hall uh, from me right now, probably just here to heckle. Uh, I see Alex there. Uh, Mike is also joined. So yeah, this is uh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm Stephen Glazier. I did my PhD at Dell with Jeff Don. Uh, I did my master's with him first and then uh, just transitioned right into the uh, PhD program. I did my undergrad at the University of Guelph uh, in Ontario. Uh, that's where I grew up. I did my undergrad in theoretical physics and kind of near the end of that, I, you know, I really liked theoretical physics in terms of just like putting pen to paper and figuring out complicated problems. But I was in my kind of senior project doing theory in NMR, uh, I realized that I did this whole like two semesters of theory and equations and solving Hamiltonians 
uh, about NMR, and I didn't understand anything about NMR, what it was actually used for, how it worked, uh, and that really started me thinking, like, I don't want to be in theory. I want to be doing something that's real, uh, you know, combining theory with hands-on and, you know, something that's relevant, something that I can, like, see and hear and, and feel and, you know, understand the impact of. Uh, so when I started looking for grad work at the end of my undergrad, uh, you know, Jeff's lab really spoke to me and luckily kind of took me in and raised me into a real scientist. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of, you know, how I, how I got into batteries. And, uh, you know, now I, I work here at Novonics uh, right out of my PhD. I was looking for what was next. And, uh, you know, luckily this company spun out of the lab. So I had, I knew Chris, who's our CEO here. And, uh, you know, Jeff was chatting with Chris and uh, he came to me right after my internal defense and said, you should go talk to Chris. Uh, you know, I think he could use some people. And uh, basically the next day I was hired uh, for finish, when I finished my PhD. And I came over here and started now two and a half years ago. And, you know, from there, Novonics has grown quite a bit. Uh, I'll give maybe a little bit of uh, history of the last couple of years at Novonics and how my role is, how my role there has changed. So when I came in, Novonics was transitioning from uh, the developing and selling of high precision battery equipment and, you know, realizing that there are some more opportunities with this uh, with this technology and the people involved in it to start actually using that technology to advance the battery field in-house. So there was a uh, the company was uh, was kind of bought by a graphite company and kind of all spun into this big picture now where we have where we make uh, battery materials and develop those materials using our knowledge and our technology, uh, spinning them out into other companies into the market. Uh, and in order to do that, we built up a cell, a pilot cell manufacturing line here where we can make uh, batteries of many different types, chemistries, formats, test them any way we want. Uh, and so when I joined, that was just kind of getting up and running and there were three of us. Uh, myself, Mark, who's here on this call, and uh, Ken. And we were really just, you know, three kids in a candy store uh, building up this lab and facility kind of from scratch. And we all had our own special areas that we uh, kind of focused on and built up together. And now there's not three of us, there's 13 or 14 of us uh, doing cell line and we have uh, running development programs for, you know, household name electronic and EV companies, uh, as well as developing our own technology in-house and still selling the testing equipment. So we're, you know, kind of involved in every direction from the market. Uh, and it's just been really exciting to be here along for the ride and, and helping build uh, all this momentum. So wow. I think uh, that's... That's my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite quite the journey, and and I I have a feeling there's probably an even brighter future ahead for for you guys and all the work that you're doing. And um, Stephen, the other day when we were chatting, you you kind of said there there are lots of opportunities locally um, right now, and you know including with Navonics um, for this type of work. And um, you know it it worked out really well for you, sort of getting hired day after your, your defense. And um, yeah, I was wondering if you could kind of provide some general advice, uh, you know, to our group here about, you know, getting in quickly and making those connections. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that we talked about was that, uh, you know, especially in a lot of the, the tech fields or the new and upcoming uh, technology or, or uh, scientific, and engineering fields, a lot of people think that you need to run off to somewhere like 
uh, Silicon Valley or big city somewhere else, Boston, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, you know, somewhere that is known to be a, a tech hub. And what's really nice to see is that there's a lot more emerging opportunities in places like Atlantic Canada. A lot of uh, tech companies are coming here. Uh, we have, you know, this interesting little battery ecosystem developing here between the multiple labs. Uh, you know, we've got us here. We've got, uh, uh, you know, Tesla's facility there supporting the uh, the the Dawn Lab. Uh, you know, it's it's really Atlantic Canada is really emerging, and it needs people. And if the people aren't here, people won't continue to to come here. So, uh, yeah, it, it's. I, I would just like to stress that you know definitely to graduates, really look around and see what's uh, what's going on and who you can get in contact with and and you know try something new because there's a lot of cool stuff getting up and going here. Thank you. So I wanted to just uh, to give the floor over to the group here um, and see if anyone had any questions right off the bat for Stephen. Um, feel free to use the, the hand up, raise your hand little function here on Teams. Um, we'd love to see your faces and hear your voices. Um, so yeah, Michael, go right ahead. Hey guys, hey Stephen. Um, hey. So I was just wondering, like you said, you started uh, as the third employee or so at uh, Novonix, right? Can you just give us an idea of like the hands-on thing you guys, things you guys <laughs> worked on, you know? Because I feel like in such a small company, like, you know, now it's obviously grown bigger, but I'm sure, you know, there were very diverse like topics that you dealt with, um, you know, just in building up this really nice uh, facility that you guys have now. Yeah, sure. Uh so yeah, I'll start by kind of clarifying that I was the the third employee on the the cell line side. Uh, so the equipment business was kind of uh, had six people or so kind of involved in it. So I think we were, I was employee eight or nine or something like that at the time, uh, some, somewhere around the ten mark. And now we're sitting at twenty nine or something like that. Uh, but yeah, coming into that, especially with three people on that side of the business, which is half of our, our building. It was, you know, three people in 10,000 square feet or so uh, with all of this new equipment coming in to make batteries from scratch and not just like little button uh, test vehicle cells, like trying to make the real deal. And, you know, that was really uh, fun. It was very challenging. Uh, you know, there were a lot of days of us all kind of turning around and looking at each other going, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and a lot of big learning curves uh, that, you know, you don't really ever get exposed to until you get out into the, I hate saying real world, but like out of somewhere mm -hmm. like academia where you, you, you know, you have your supervisor looking out for you. They're doing all the sourcing. They've, uh, especially if you're in a big group like chefs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, where, there's a, uh, there are lab associates taking care of that kind of stuff and coming into, uh, you know, here where it's like, we are the everything, right? <laughs> you know, we have to make sure that the electricians are going to show up and hook up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the right, uh, power requirements for all the, the equipment. We have to come up with ways of QCing things, uh, come up with all the new the systems and design sheets uh and so that was was really fun there was a lot of like really like physical hands-on things uh and then a lot of like building up infrastructure even in terms of data infrastructure that was one of my biggest challenges mm, okay. uh, coming in learning from uh kind of uh some of the pipeline like data pipeline choke points that we ended up having in some of the uh, the labs and saying, how can we build a, a system from the ground up while we have a chance now, rather than figuring it out five years from now, let's build up a nice uh, system that is going to make it efficient down the road so that we can have three people doing the work and the number of, the, of test cell testing that 
20 people do mm-hmm. in an academic lab because in industry you're you are really uh constrained by finances uh so we, we you know can't have as many uh, the number of cells per scientist has to be mm-hmm. very high in terms of turnover and testing and analyzing data all right yeah well, uh, thank you. that's of, that's an oh, interesting metric sales per scientist <laughs> yeah and you know some of the other things that we always tell people uh when we're doing interviews like uh you know here everyone has is involved a little bit in everything and i think that's really important uh while we're still small too is to have everyone appreciate every step of the process uh you know and when we were starting out and still mark and ken still do this uh literally doing the dishes <laughs> making batteries is not clean work mm-hmm. and you know there when push comes to shove you know the most senior guys uh here are washing and scrubbing uh mm-hmm. mixing pots and uh all the coding equipment uh just to like get things done get to the next step uh mm-hmm. you know make things happen so that's those are some of the you know the the fun things that doing dishes isn't fun but it's I don't know, in, in hindsight it's 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 kind of fun to, to know that we we get mm-hmm. to see the whole picture and appreciate every nice yeah shows the it. spirit shows the spirit for sure yeah. cool thank you for your question um and actually you just kind of mentioned something you you mentioned a few things in that section that um that spurred a question for me and um you talked about interviewing and um, what would be some tips that you would have for for someone who is interviewing for like an industry role, like a, a role at some somewhere like Navonics? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I would definitely recommend, which we, you know, is an easy filter sometimes when we're giving interviews, is uh, really understand the role and company that you're applying to. Uh, you know, as science students, it's probably not a big issue. Uh, you know, just do the background research and figure out uh, the big picture, uh, not just what the job description talks about, but really what the the company is about, what the job really means and how it moves the company. Uh, because sometimes we'll ask, we'll ask questions that the interviewees would, would have benefited by just knowing a bit more about the company or the bigger picture. And being able to express how their skills can are beneficial to the company and how they're they're going to really push us forward. Uh, just kind of understanding the how you can help and benefit the company, but also the people there too, because you're really making a personal connection with these people. And you know, we're going to be trying to make the new employee be their best person while they're here. And ideally, we're going to be hiring the people that are going to bring out the best in us too. So trying to make those those connections with the bigger picture is, is really important. Awesome, that's really excellent advice. Thank you. Uh, so I, w- I want to turn it back to the group and see if anyone has any any questions. Feel free to use the, the hand up um, here on Teams. Um, or if not, um, you're always welcome to put any questions that you have into the chat here and we can certainly pass them along. Um, so yeah, I'll give it that extra, that, that little three to five seconds of awkwardness to see if anyone puts their hand up. Um, I have some more questions here, if not, but. Yeah, I, I can also like, maybe I can ask a question to the, uh, yeah. the little colorful dots down there. Uh, and is, uh, is there, oh, somebody. Oh, asked there, something there, is there. A, there is a question. Do you want it? I'll read it for you, and then sure. do you want to hold that thought, and then we'll we'll yeah. we'll move on to your question. Okay, so um, it's from Alexander, um, who doesn't have a micro camera. Um, so can you speak at all about how compensation works with stock options? Salary is pretty obvious, but what typical stock options are is a bit more ambiguous. Yeah, so uh, I'm. I'll start off with like what stock options are. Uh, and it's basically a way of an employee to access uh, purchasing stocks at a reduced rate. Uh, so, you know, say you are offered 
something at uh, a big company like Tesla and they say, you know, you'll get, uh, you know, this much per year and your signing offer is also going to come with, uh, you know, 50,000 or not with Tesla, 50 <laughs> stock options at this dollar value. Uh, what it means is like usually it's like the dollar value when you start when you're going to sign on and then those will become accessible to you in like maybe half one year later and half another year later and if the stock has gone up say two times that when those options what they call vest in that one and two year intervals you have access to those uh, shares at that original price that you signed on at so you can make that 100% uh, gain on the, the stocks on your options just by selling them the next day. Uh, so it's a, a way of giving some uh, giving compensation to employees uh, without you know a company necessarily breaking the bank during those years. And you know it, it incentivizes the employees to really push the business every inch that they can move the business forward then increases their chance of having that share price go two times or three times or even 20 percent you know anything is a gain and the nice thing about stock options is it's it's really just a free money uh if the stock doesn't increase at all you just don't exercise those options because you're not going to buy it for more than they're worth uh does that answer your question? Uh, Alexander. See, see if you Alexander's typing, typing so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> might be a little follow up there. But I had no idea how how that worked I had, as being a, a lifelong public sector <laughs> employee. Yeah. But and you know um, I've got some yeah. friends at at uh, at some of these bigger companies, and you know they can take bonuses as either cash or shares or options. And if you take them as options, you get like more value out of them because the company doesn't actually have to give you that money. Right. They're just kind of giving you the option to do that. Right. <laughs> Alexander's follow up question. Can you speak at all about what kind of options you got? Hopefully this isn't too rude uh, a question or top secret. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I can't really speak to uh, to that. That's OK. Thank you. I, You know, I think it's it's an important question, you know, questions about salary and compensation and and your options are absolutely really important to explore. And yeah, um, and yeah. what I can say to that is like, you know, uh, you should always ask, yeah. you know, when when going to a uh, when going into negotiations after you have not a successful interview, uh, typically, you know, you don't get offered a, a salary on the spot. You'll have an interview and then you'll get a follow up op offer and the biggest thing to keep in mind is that it is it is what they're calling it it's an offer and you can make a counter offer you can ask your questions you can push uh and you can you know find some some middle ground and see where people are willing to move and where they're not you know i'll i'll speak to like my uh offer acceptance uh the only thing i did is i asked for a little more vacation time because uh, like I wasn't going to, especially with a, a young startup company, I wasn't going to, you know, push for more. I just wanted to make sure that I had some time off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I figured the rest would speak for itself. And that's, you know, and the other things that you can uh, hope on if you're not, you know, completely satisfied with an offer is you say, well, you know, this is only what it is right now. I think they just... When yeah. you are looking at these like scientific and engineering fields, you know, over the course of a few years, especially if you're making an impact and doing a good job, you know, you you start talking with your supervisors, you have these six month uh, progress meetings and reports where you can bring these things up. So what you start at is not locked in stone forever. Right. Awesome. Thank you. And I really appreciate you, you being so candid about that and as candid as you can be. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your question, Alexander. Um, Stephen, I know you said you had you had a question for the group, so I can I'll turn it over to you to to ask that if you'd like. Yeah, and maybe I'll just uh, I'll do this with saying like, you know, put your hands up uh, <laughs> if you're if you're an undergrad right now. 
or do we have almost all grads like with the with the names here i know that people are either out of school or in grad school uh so okay so everyone's in grad school so who's who is in grad school then if you can do the hand thing i know two of the other yep there's one okay yeah okay and then who's out of school then I don't know how to put up my hand. Okay, that's okay, Alex. <laughs> yeah, who's who's out of school? Yeah, there's Mike. Okay. And Do Mark. I count? Mark. I'm oh yeah, that's Mark. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it is it is uh, mostly uh, it's it's a good mix. Okay, actually. Uh, yeah. So I guess in if everyone's in grad school, then my my comments about undergrads you know not being afraid to ask questions and really get into labs <laughs> doesn't really uh you know everyone kind of has been there at some point but Stephen, what I, what I will say is that because we're recording this and we'll be sharing this re recording far and wide uh, yeah. please continue to to share that advice because i'm sure there's there's a lot of students who maybe couldn't attend today who would sure. still like to hear that advice so yeah please go ahead yeah so in my first year at university of guelph uh, I was kind of interested in, you know, what can I do in the uh, the summer months for for income that wasn't working in a restaurant because I was really kind of sick of that. Uh, and I just kind of on a whim went to my first year professor and, uh, you know, said, what's your research and do you need any help? And uh, and I was mostly just looking for experience. And he was like, you know, do you want a job? And uh, so it was like this like huge moment of realization of like, I don't have to be a top student. I don't have to be uh, you know, like, all you have to do is go and ask. And a lot of these professors will just, you know, take you on in whatever capacity they can. Uh, sometimes it's it's just volunteers. Sometimes you can get the uh, uh, student research awards uh, or apply for the financial need based research awards uh, and yeah it's, it was amazing how many of my uh, my peers in undergrad ended up in all of these uh, programs and really got a head start on their graduate work but also just getting a feel for what they wanted to do uh, some people went straight from undergrad uh, into careers loosely based on what they were doing in their summer jobs uh, so they and a few people started in uh, in some summer research jobs that they really thought they were going to be into, yeah. and were able to really quickly screen themselves out of a specific field. I had a friend that uh, started working with a lab, working on a Mars rover uh, X-ray probe, and uh, he did that for two summers. And now he's a uh, transportation engineering uh, modeler, like wow. he does models for huge transportation networks. Uh, he just really found that that wasn't his thing and then tried a couple other things during some summers and and now, you know, was able to finish school and do exactly what he wanted to do. That's awesome. No, that's, I think that's, that's really important advice and we've been, been quite lucky this week to have a few other guests uh, come in and talk about their experience in this sort of general research and discovery area and they've literally all said the exact same thing that you just said and, and it's to be proactive and to reach out on your own to to faculty members who have research that interests you and you know they're they're likely to <laughs> to need someone if that's if it's either a volunteer role or a paid role and really it's like sowing that seed and and starting somewhere so it's your your advice really is is very common from what we've heard across the board and it's excellent advice, I think. So thank you. Um, I see Alexander is typing another question again, but um, is there anyone else in the group who, who has a question who'd like to put their hand up? You've got a very busy office, office there. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hey, Stephen. Um, I had a quick question just about, like you'd mentioned how your role has already evolved um, at Novonics, and I'm just wondering, and I know you said you had like a bunch of meetings today, but I'm kind of 
wondering what a like a typical day would be like for you and then also be like how you expect your role to change in the next year or the next five years or sure yeah so a typical day for me right now uh so at the moment uh a lot of us that have been here for a bit wear quite a few hats uh so my most common hat uh i think i actually need a physical one is like a fire hat uh because it, it just see like we kind of call every like everything's a fire like oh, i gotta go and do this and now i have to do this uh there's no real structure to my day right now uh it's just getting things done until everything's done and uh usually that involves uh half the day in meetings either internally or with all the customer development projects that we're working with uh so my lab is or my <laughs> my day is usually about 50 percent uh in uh meetings and uh whether it's going over data with people or uh planning experiments and uh planning projects and then about 25 percent of my day i would say is doing actual analysis and working on uh you know just myself thinking doing things and then another maybe 25 percent of my day is spent uh actually in the lab looking at things getting hands on getting cells on test uh and you know trans moving forward uh kind of transitioning away so much from the hands-on stuff even though you know i really like it as you know as you kind of move on especially if you start early in a company and kind of move up as it uh as more people come in uh you know that's just kind of the natural progression is to get more involved in leadership and management and then to uh you know have have people working with you to do all of the lab stuff even though i'd really love to be there uh you know i i do like the more management side of things and it allows me to be part of more projects as well uh if i'm able to to sit more and uh and delegate and kind of have a bird's eye view of everything but not have to do each individual task uh, i get to be part of more and learn learn more just less uh in depth in every aspect of the projects so it's kind of a, a different different from our you know my original role which was you know just hands-on 100 percent figuring things out developing all of our techniques uh, and now it's really utilizing them to do as much as possible so yeah over the next year or so i see my role transitioning more towards the uh, meetings and planning uh, which i'm totally okay with because it's all fun stuff we're involved in a lot of really cool projects sweet thank you thanks for your question lauren I saw um, I have one. That's okay. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for talking. Uh, I just had a couple questions. One is, um, what what, are, what what would you say the primary skills are to be successful at Novonics? And then two, what would you say is the most challenging uh, problem facing your company? Sure. Yeah. Those are some pretty big questions. Uh, so the one of the biggest assets to have to to work here. I would say is being flexible, uh, you know, being able to do, you know, to have a couple things on the go at once and be able to change what you're doing at a kind of a moment's notice and be able to work on something else. Uh, that's one type of flexibility, just like mental flexibility uh, to change focuses and switch from one project to another. Uh, but another is uh, skill sets. And I think this is true for a lot of early businesses is, uh, you know, it's really hard to hire people that are highly specialized in one very small area when you're uh, growing. Uh, you want to hire people where they're, you know, they have multiple skills uh, that, that you can see being part of your business moving forward. Uh, people with hands on experience with, uh, you know, in terms of like physics and chemistry, I would say like, uh, not just theoretical work, but yes, they've done lab work, uh, bonus, uh, if they 
built some equipment before and got it functional or designed equipment and then used it to do things. Uh, you know, programming skills like these kind of uh, flexibility where where you know you can be able to uh, trust that someone can really take a, pro a whole project and be able to really turn it into something without requiring a lot of extra uh, people or infrastructure. Uh, so that's just speaking from more of a uh, young business perspective. Okay. From a very big business perspective, uh, that's where you know sometimes you you have people looking for very specific skill sets, and then it's not really an issue. But for us specifically, we like to look at people that are very flexible with their skill sets and what they can do, what they've done, how they think. Okay, great. And I think my second one was, um, what's the biggest challenge facing Novonics? Right now, uh, I would say like, you know, today, this week, <laughs> uh, it's uh, space limitations. Uh, we've grown very quickly uh, and we're, uh, you know, you can see people walking by. Uh, we're basically out of desk space now. Uh, we, and we still need to, you know, keep hiring. Uh, we're out of floor space where uh, we you know, want to have more test equipment, more analytical equipment. We want to, we have people basically knocking down the door trying to get in to do projects with us uh, and uh, and order things from us. And we're saying like, whoa, 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 slow down. Uh, so we've actually got a like 9,000 square foot addition going on the back of the building right now. Uh, so we're under construction from every angle right now in our facility. And it's it's like, that's just a big physical uh, hurdle right now to kind of get over. Like we just lost our boardroom this week indefinitely. And so like, that's why I'm taking this uh, call from my cubicle here. Uh, people are having analytical equipment moved into their offices uh, that they don't even use. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. you know the S the SEM has to go somewhere that's not being uh, uh, having a jackhammer going like crazy near it. So that's that's our biggest. Uh, okay, great. Thank right you. Now. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Um, so we have a, another question in the chat here from Alex, uh, who says, "I'll keep monopolizing your time until people ask more questions," and that's exactly why we're here today, Alexander. So. Um, this is, yeah, this is your time to monopolize <laughs> or ask questions. Um, so their question is, can you talk about the new experience you've gained at Novonix since leaving Jeff's lab, which is the first part, and then I'll, I'll follow up with the second one. Um, it's a great question. Yeah. So experience I've gained since then. Yeah. So if I like look back two and a half years at myself coming out of, uh, Jeff's lab, uh, one of the first things that. I really learned was, uh, or we really had to tackle was uh, the design of uh, lithium ion cells and creating, you know, our own uh, standardized designs and making them consistently. Uh, I had this like fantasy view of making batteries when I was in Jeff's lab uh, because we'd get them all sent in these little, uh, wound pouch cells from a company in China and I'd look at them and say like oh there must be like you know just a you know a few machines that fit in a room that can make these and then coming here and that was our first kind of cell design and it was you know it's our whole facility to make those size of cells there's so many uh, steps in the process and such tight specifications uh, I had it in my head like oh you know Jeff's lab goes through so many of these cells Maybe we should, maybe he should just invest in a small little cell line in the building, but it would take an entire like half a physics building to do it. Uh, so that was one of the, the first things yeah. that I really learned and started to appreciate all of the uh, fine details about uh, cell building and how really finicky it is uh, and, and the designs around the cells. Uh, some other things that, uh, some of the wait, what was the question again? I, I kind of got rambling. So no. How my experiences. Uh, the uh, the new experience you have gained uh, since being Jeff okay. Lab. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, it's hard to to compare back because it's been just a constant kind of transition. Uh, but learning a lot about how to talk with people in the industry uh, is was a, a big challenge. It's very different from going to an academic conference and uh, you know chatting with people that are doing academic work that kind of know everything that is going on. Uh, know how batteries work, especially. Uh, you know, half the people that come to us uh, looking for battery development uh, projects and help, uh, it's surprising how many don't actually know how batteries function. And they're really looking for us to tell them what they need to do, what experiments they need to do, and then what they mean. And what they mean, not just in terms of, you know, you, you can make it charge faster with this, what it means from a business perspective. So there's kind of all of this, everything in industry, you start transitioning away from what this means in terms of like, oh, cool, this will make batteries much better and it'll you know push the, the field forward and help uh, you know everything that we're really trying to do with batteries in terms of uh, enabling energy storage and EVs. Uh, but you have to, unfortunately, learn to, to spin it and, and tell people how to how this is going to help your business right. uh, or else no one's actually going to do the work with you. So that's a skill that was like honed over, you know, trial and error over the last little while. Cool. Uh, so that, that, yeah, that was also, I guess, to I think it was Zach's question. Uh, you know, that's one of my challenges over the years, not just at this point. But it's a transition, be able to think academically when I need to, mm. but also to think in that kind of business way. I like that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there was a second part to Alexander's question is, um, if for whatever reason you wanted to leave and get a job somewhere else, do you think what you have learned at Novonix has made you even more valuable to other battery companies? <laughs> Alexander is just asking these hard hitting <laughs> questions here. <laughs> That's Alex, 100%. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I do think so. And uh, you know, it, pretty much exactly this time last year, I was approached by another company to go, and uh, and work for them. And uh, I went and interviewed, and uh, you know, I almost pulled the trigger on it, uh, but I decided to stay. And pretty much for that reason, if I ever do, if the you know reasons stack up that I I actually want to go somewhere else. I have full confidence that I'll be able to get a job and I don't, you know, that my experience here has enabled that and I, I won't really have to worry, will I be able to find a job? Uh, so I think that, that the experience here has been really helpful there. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. And Alexander says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Zach, go ahead and then I'll. I'm oh, sorry. Did I cut someone off? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask a question in the, the chat afterwards, but go ahead. I had a few questions. Uh, that's OK. Probably too yeah. many. Uh, <laughs> one is, I don't know if you have any insight to other battery companies, but what would it, what would be what would be so special about Novonics that makes it stand out from others? That's one question I have. And then, yes. Yeah, sure, go ahead. And then I'll ask okay. the other. After. Yeah, sure. And you know what Novonics really is, is, uh, you know, Unlike someone like a, you know, like an EV company, or you know, somebody with a product, is we don't have a specific application that we're building a product for. Uh, we're developing more technologies and materials uh, in-house, uh, and working with other companies, especially if they have like startups that can be. That can end up being some kind of joint venture and spun out into something bigger. So we're more like a technology hub, uh, or you know, a, a what would you call it, incubation okay. uh, facility, where we, you know, in our spare time, haha, uh, we get to, you know, work on internal projects and what we think is really cool and could be big and useful. Uh, but then also work with all these other companies on solving their problems, moving the industry forward in that way. And then these companies that come and have some ideas but need some expertise to really get them going, then we can join up and partner with those companies, 
become one unit and make something happen with that. Uh, so what's what's kind of nice is there's not one overarching goal that you're kind of bound to, like always moving towards that one. There's always something different happening okay. and things are spinning out with a lot of momentum. Uh, you know, some things, you know, stumble and fall flat on their faces, but we get to learn from every single one of those. Uh, and that was one of the reasons I chose to stay here is there's so many kind of interesting things happening and so many different opportunities in different directions uh, rather than kind of being under one one overarching goal. Uh, okay. But there are definitely benefits to both. So yeah. yeah. And then I had a couple others. One is, um, would you be able to share, is there like a favorite customer you like working for or one that you would like to work with? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I can't really mention any any names, especially oh. with the bigger ones. Uh, but, you know, we I really like working with uh, a lot of the like EV companies that there's like, that's, that's the like, uh, you know, the, the big fancy thing is, for batteries is working in the EV space, but it's also like the biggest challenge. Uh, the application in itself, uh, consumers want more and more and more. They want thousand kilometers of range in their car. They want to charge it in five minutes. Yeah. You know, so it's the most challenging thing. And the way some of these companies are, are doing uh, things is really intriguing. And the way they're really pushing boundaries is really interesting. Uh, so we like working on some of those projects because they're uh, we learn a lot the uh, clients learn a lot and there's there's a lot of space to uh, collaborate and spin out some of these new ideas into uh, into the field okay great and sorry my last question is um, are there like graduate co-op work placements that are interested in Novonics that could be applied for yeah so we uh, we kind of historically have done it kind of on a case-by-case -case basis right. uh, you know, we we're growing so quickly that we we find out that we need somebody three weeks after we needed them. Uh, so <laughs> we're trying to catch up on that uh, that hiring process now uh, to be a little more forward looking and and be able to uh, to kind of get into more of the academic co-op programs and like say in three or four months uh, we're going to need some people. Uh, you know, we'll we'll be looking for somebody. Uh, so that's that's definitely what we're looking forward into now. Uh, we have had a few co-op students work with us uh, in the past, but it was uh, you know pretty pretty quick for us to say, right. like, oh, we we'd like a co-op student. Hey, look, somebody looking for a co-op position. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, sorry, there was another part of that question. No, I th I think that was it. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I will I will relay Jocelyn's question here in the comments. Um, do you think you'll explore any additional education, project management, MBA, things like that? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, not not in the short term or the medium term, especially uh, something I've always kind of joked with, uh, especially my wife about is that uh, you know, at some point in my life, I could maybe see myself doing a PhD in biology. She's a biologist. Oh, wow. Uh, but that would be like, you know, next career, 20 years <laughs> down the road, uh, you know, just for fun. Yeah. Because uh, I've been involved in a few projects uh, collaborating with uh, her and some uh, collaborators with not pro non for profits and uh, uh, NGOs, just doing some some studies and uh, help her with some of her uh, coding occasionally for contracts with governments and NGOs. So it's something I'm kind of interested in down down the road, maybe. Uh, cool. But that's just a you know, kind of a dream in the back of my mind somewhere. It's not every day you hear someone talk about doing a, a PhD just for fun. So <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. And, and I, maybe that kind of weaves into my my next question that I've been wondering. Um, and you you sort of addressed it in your your introduction about, you know, leaving theoretical physics um, and going into, you know, industry and 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 this. And um, why did you choose 
industry over academia. Um, you know, with a with a PhD, you'd be able to sort of teach and be in that university world. And yeah, if you could talk about that a little bit more, the the decision to go this way and not the other way. Uh, a lot of it was looking at what uh, a lot of new profs just kind of had to go through. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, but everyone has their their own opinions about teaching courses and uh, kind of the, I don't know, the university system in general. And I won't get into too many of my opinions there, but uh, like having to, to kind of teach and stick to uh, some of the rules about uh, the, or the early prof stages sound really stressful and really hard. Uh, you know, I've known a couple of friends that have gone that route and just like trying to get their labs up and running and get funding and get uh, get teaching a lot. It wasn't something that I really was looking for. Uh, I was toying with getting like going into a postdoc and then uh, I just didn't want to be 40 years old without a, a like permanent career. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, that that's just my personal outlook on it. And I did really want to get uh, start to apply my knowledge right away into something that was real and mattered, especially because batteries are so applied mm -hmm. and the, the market and the industry is exploding right now. It was also just a natural transition. Uh, if I had done something that wasn't quite as industrially applicable or didn't have a need for so many scientists in that field, then maybe I would have gone more in the academic route. Right. Uh, but it was for for my field at the time, just the right place, right time to just get in and start running. Cool. Um, and you've you've been you've been with Novonics now for you said two and a half years, correct? And I'm sure in that time the the industry has changed a lot and like you said, just exploded. And where do you see where do you see the the sector or the industry going in the next five, ten years? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> fast and big. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's not going to be enough people. There's not going to be enough uh, materials and technology and infrastructure to move fast enough. Uh, and I think that's going to make it really stressful, but really fun mm -hmm. uh, to be part of trying to make the solutions to uh, not be the bottleneck. Uh, you know, a lot of what we focus on here are ways to make battery technology, uh, I think it's like faster, cleaner, cheaper is our three words that we, we look for. And each of those things are critical for the next five to 10 years, have to move away faster than we're currently moving. Uh, everything has to be done cleaner uh, so all of the manufacturing methods need to be uh, be using less water, fewer chemicals, uh, less waste, and a lot less energy. Uh, and then cheaper is the other like huge one. If it's not cheap, it's not going to be adopted uh, and invested in. So that's uh, yeah, the next five to ten years is going to be absolutely crazy in this field. Uh, and just really excited to be part of it in the momentum gaining stage. Awesome, that's great, thank you. So we we are just about at time here. We've got about three minutes left here on the clock. Um, are there any final questions for Stephen before we, before we leave today? Oh, Jocelyn, go ahead. <laughs> Can always count on you for my closing question. <laughs> This is a little bit of a loaded question. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, Jeff Don presented uh, at the Bicentennial uh, lecture for the 200th anniversary, and he, he said a statement and it stuck with me for a really long time. And he said in approximately 10 to 15 years, he thought it would be socially unacceptable acceptable not to have an electric vehicle. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think his predictions are accurate? I 
I think his predictions are pretty accurate. Uh, I think there's there's always going to be a time and a place for internal combustion, uh, especially when you you need uh, vehicles with huge power requirements or they need to be way off, uh, you know, in the field somewhere and just don't have access to the necessary infrastructure uh, for for charging capabilities. But uh, in terms of like 99% of transportation, uh, I feel like it's going to be, uh, all of it's going to be electric, uh, you know, unless you need to, unless you actually need to go a thousand kilometers at a time without stopping for 45 minutes, which I don't think there are many applications that require that. Uh, I think it is going to end up being somewhat socially unacceptable. Uh, or at least you'd be an outlier or part of a a niche uh, far non green group uh, <laughs> if you if you don't have some kind of uh, EV whether it's you know plug in hybrid electric or or even just like hybrids like right now I own a Prius and I I really hope that I see more and more of those on the road uh, even even as EVs are, are dominating. Yeah. I drive electric too. Love it. <laughs> but it was hard to buy in like Atlanta, Canada, not a lot of uh, options. So hopefully that changes. Yeah. I hope hopefully in the next like couple of years, uh, I want to get there. They're just expensive right now. So that's yeah. why the faster, cleaner, cheaper comes in. <laughs> Absolutely. The faster I can do my job, the faster uh, <laughs> I might be able to afford a cheaper EV. Yeah. <laughs> we'll keep going. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank you so much for for really fascinating conversation and all the thoughtful questions that we got from the group today. Um, I'm I'm going to say that this has been one of my favorite conversations we've had in this series so far. I think the quality of questions that we got from the group um, were really excellent and appreciate you for for answering them and and especially some of the more tricky ones, but that are really important when we're talking about careers and next steps. So. Really appreciate it. So thank you so much, Stephen, and have a great long weekend, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Stephen. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.